All right, we'll just, um, we'll kick off. So hello everyone, um, thank you very much for joining. Hope everyone's keeping safe and well amidst this crazy weather that we're having. Um, welcome to this latest instalment in our series of Lot Lab webinars. Uh, we're delighted to have so many of you joining us today. Usually we um, use these webinars as an opportunity to cover a mixture of recent interesting case law and upcoming legislative changes but there are so many changes on the horizon for 2024. So today we're focusing solely on legislative changes for, for this year and, and to some extent beyond. There's a lot to cover. So this will be a bit of a high level whistle stop stop tour through um, many of the changes to have on your radar. I've got my lovely colleagues, Gav and Vincent with me today. <clears throat> uh, give a wave, Gav and Vincent. Uh, Gav will be covering the employment law changes with me first of all and then we'll pass over to Vincent for a rundown of what to look out for on the immigration side of things. Um, there's a lot to get through but please don't worry about furiously scribbling down notes during today's session and um, we'll cover these topics in our written bulletin too and of course you'll receive the recording of today's webinar. So a few housekeeping matters before we, we get into the body of the session. Now that you've joined, can you please ensure that your mute button has been selected just to limit any background noise? If you're anything like us, you've got the sound of rain battering your windows, so just to keep that to a minimum. Um, feel free to ask questions via the chat function. We'll keep an eye on that. We'll do our best to answer them in the time that we have, but feel, uh, do feel free to reach out to us directly or to your usual Bernice Paul contact after the session if you have any questions too. Finally, as you will have seen, today's webinar is being recorded. And if you have any questions on that for queries, please check out our privacy policy on the Bernice Paul website. And the next slide, please. Thank you. So here is a rundown of um, the key employment law topics that we're going to cover today. But before we crack on, uh, just a quick word about a couple of topics that you might spot are missing from this list. So firstly, Certain changes were made to the working time regulations with effect from the 1st of January this year. In summary, that new law generally codifies existing case law in relation to firstly carryover of leave during sickness and family leave, but also the payment of four weeks euro leave, which must be paid at normal pay, which means including things like regular overtime and commission. It also importantly introduces a new category of regular and part year workers, with specific complex rights and entitlements um, and reintroduce, reintroduces rather rolled up holiday pay using a calculation of 12.7% of pay for part year workers and those who work irregular hours. <clears throat> now, the reason they're not on this slide is because we're not going to cover those changes today, uh, but you should all have received the invite to the webinar that we held at the end of last year where we covered those changes. If not, there is a recording of that session available and that will be linked in the written bulletin that will be issued following this webinar. What I do want to flag though, um, which is quite interesting, is that the government has issued guidance on the changes to holiday entitlement and pay, but please be cautious of that. We've been working through it and we've noticed some potential inaccuracies in the interpretation of, of that new legislation in some parts of the guidance. So do get in touch with your usual Bernice Ball contact if you've got any queries. Separately, there are some minor changes to the TUPI regulations, which will apply to transfers which take place on or after the 1st of July 2024. But again, we covered off uh, those in the webinar recording from the end of last year, so we won't be covering that off today. The other topic that you might notice is missing from this list relates to a new piece of legislation which deals with um, tipping and it involves significant changes for employers who handle staff tips. It places new obligations on employers to distribute tips fully, fairly and transparently, and that right is expected to come into force in July 2024. However, having had a look at our, um, our participants today, we're not going to cover that in any detail because it will be irrelevant for the vast majority of you. But please do get in touch if tipping is relevant within your organisation, as um, those organisations will need to start work on written policies to cover off those changes and to consider how to communicate with staff and consult with workers regarding that new policy. So, having covered what we're not going to cover, moving swiftly on now to the topics that we will be covering in some detail today, I'll pass over to Gab, first of all, to discuss carers leave. Thank you, Vincent. 
Thanks very much, Rachel. Yeah, so as Rachel has said, the first change that we're going to cover in a bit more detail then is carers' leave. So there's been quite a lot of discussion about this over the past year because actually the Act came into, well, the Act was passed last year, so the Carers Leave Act 2023, um, but the rights in that don't actually come into force until the 6th of April this year. And currently we have regulations which are in draft form, and so we're going to run through those. Um, like I said, they're in draft form, but we don't really anticipate that there's going to be any big change or changes to these. So hopefully what we're seeing now is going to be the up-to-date guidance at the time of implementation. Um, and the government will also be publishing their up-to-date guidance on the 6th of April when the regulations come into force. So in terms of what the Carers Leave Act covers then, so this is creating a new right for unpaid carers. Uh, to take up to one week of unpaid leave in any 12-month period. And the one week can either be taken in full day, so it can be taken, well, in full, it can be taken in half days, or it can be taken up to and including a block of one continuous week. Um, it's worth pointing out that the calculation of what a week is can vary depending on the work, the employee rather. So if they have variable hours, um, for example, like you do with holiday pay calculations, you might do a difference for one week, um, then it will be calculated differently to a full-time worker. But there are going to be specific provisions on that in the regulations. And in terms of how the leave itself can be used, so employers will be able to use the leave to provide um, or arrange care of a person who is considered a dependent. And in terms of the Act, it defines a dependent as either a spouse, a partner, a civil partner, a child, a parent, a person who lives in the same household, uh, that's as long as they're not a boarder, an employee, a lodger or a tenant, or a person who reasonably relies on the employee to provide a range of care for them. So actually quite a broad range of people there who could be caught as a dependent. And it's also worth pointing out that providing care for someone who reasonably depends on the employee for care. So you don't have to be a primary caregiver to do that. It could be that actually the primary carer is taking a period of respite and the employee is therefore responsible for them for a certain period. So it doesn't have to be someone who is uh, kind of taking full-time care. It could be someone who's also covering a primary carer that's caught. So as I said, quite a broad definition there for who could be entitled to this. Um, in terms of who qualifies as a dependent as well, so they have to have a long-term care need. Um, so that means that they have a physical or mental illness or injury that requires or is likely to require care for more than three months, um, or they have a disability as defined under the Equality Act 2010, which has a separate kind of definition which we deal with regularly. So not all cases will satisfy that, but again, kind of a question of interpretation. And finally, that the individual requires care for a reason connected with their old age. Uh, in terms of the right itself, then, so worth pointing out that this is a day one right, um, as I'm sure you'll all be aware that are some leave rights or employee rights generally that don't take effect until you've got a certain amount of service, but this one will be a day one right. And in terms of actually using the leave itself, so there's a prescribed form in terms of the notice that needs to be given for that, um, and there are also timing requirements, so the notice given must either be twice as many days as the period of leave requested. So if you're taking one week of leave, then you'll need to give two weeks of notice or it needs to be given at least three days in advance, whichever is the earlier of those two requirements. Uh, in terms of the notice requirements, so it's set out there, but the employer employer can waive it if they want to. Um, it's ultimately a question of their discretion if the requirements aren't met. And in terms of evidence that needs to be, to be supplied, an employer can't request that an employee supplies evidence in terms of the caring need. So it's really um, going on trust in terms of that, that leave there. Uh, in terms of protections with this leave, so kind of as with other statutory leave entitlements, uh, an employer can't subject an employee to a detriment for taking or trying to take carer's leave. And if there was a dismissal linked to this, um, then that would be an automatically unfair dismissal. Uh, it's also worth pointing out that an employer can postpone the request by a period for up to one month um, where the employer reasonably considers that the operation of their business would be unduly disrupted if the employee took that leave during the period um, and the notice provided, but they have to notify the employee within seven days of receiving the request if they are going to postpone it. Uh, 
And finally, I think just a practical tip to flag. So some employers do already operate a policy similar to this um, or have it in their contracts. And where that is the case, if an employee already has a contractual right to take carer's leave, then they don't get the double advantage of this. So they can either use one or the other. Um, effectively, they get to use the one that's more favourable to them, but they can't utilise both. Uh, that wraps up on carer's leave. And I'm now going to pass back to Rachel to cover the changes to paternity leave. Fab, thanks very much, Gav. Yeah, so just continuing on the kind of leave topic, we're also expecting some changes to paternity leave um, as set out in some new regulations which are due to come into force on the 8th of March. Uh, so at present, as you'll all be familiar with, fathers or partners can take a block of one or two weeks but can't take another week at a different date if they only take one week. So it's kind of locked in at the start of, of the, the, the child's life essentially. Um, but the, these new draft regulations allow the leave to be taken in two separate blocks of one week if preferred. Additionally, um, currently statutory paternity leave must be taken within the first eight weeks after birth or placement for adoption, whereas this proposed change is that leave will be able to take, be taken at any time within the 52 weeks of birth or placement for adoption, so much more flexibility there. At present, uh, notice of the date on which an employee wants paternity leave to start has to be provided 15 weeks before birth, so quite a long lead-in period. Um, and these draft regulations provide that an employee will need to give 28 days notice instead, so a much shorter period um, of notice before they intend to take uh, that leave. Although, oh, sorry, I can just see we've had a question on... Um, the slides, no, it's not just you, Joanne. What I would say is um, the slides are just very high level. So for our employment changes, we've just got this slide here and we're just talking you through the detail. But um, as I say, no, no need to worry about taking notes as we've got the, the more detailed bulletin following and the recording. Um, but thank you very much for flagging. And yeah, so back to notice requirements. Um, so shortening that notice requirement um, although notice of entitlement will still need to be given 15 weeks before birth, so a longer lead in time for that. Um, the notice period, however, remains unchanged for domestic adoption cases where notice of adoption uh, leave dates must be given no more than seven days after the adopter is told that they'd be matched with a child or as soon as reasonably practicable thereafter if that seven day deadline isn't reasonably practicable. Uh, finally, a notice of leave dates may be varied if 28 days notice is given. And these changes will apply to children whose expected week of birth begins after the 6th of April 2024 and for children who are expected to be placed for adoption or whose date of entry to Britain is on or after the 6th of April 2024. So um, this is one where changes should be made to your family leave policies to reflect these, these changes. I think the biggest practical impact will be with that ability to take blocks of one or two weeks leave at any time within 52 weeks rather than eight weeks. And um, the notice provisions I think will probably be of less practical impact. I think the reality is that babies come when they come and most employers are very flexible in terms of allowing paternity leave to be taken following the birth of, of a baby or adoption um, without strictly speaking that necessary 28 day deadline. So I think that will be less of a significant change for employers going forward. Moving swiftly on to flexible working with Gav. Thanks Rachel. Uh, yeah, so flexible working, I suppose this is one that's had a lot of general discussion recently um, post-COVID with employees looking for more flexibility in their working arrangements. Um, and now there has been a change to the actual flexible working regime. So um, from 6th of April 2024, the right to make a flexible working request is going to become a day one right. Um, and that will come into effect for any requests made on or after that date. Uh, currently under the flexible working rules you have to have at least 26 weeks continuous service before you can make a request um so it is quite a significant change in terms of the timings and the conditions associated with it um separately there's also further legislation so the employment relations flexible working act 2023 um, and that makes further changes to the flexible working regime itself um so originally it was anticipated that those rights would come into force in july 2024 um, but it now looks like these will also come into force in the April with the change to the day one right. So we need further regulations on that 
to bring them into the force. So it's really just a case of keep an eye on that and see when they come in. Um, and just to flag, so in terms of place for working, what that can include. So it can include a change in working hours. Um, it can include a change in working pattern, or it can also include a change to a place of work. So that's a kind of non-exhaustive list, but really the classic ones that we see. Um, in terms of the Flexible Working Act, so the changes that's going to make, firstly, it will be increasing employees' entitlement to request flexible working. So currently you can only make one request in a 12-month period, but it's now going to be up to two. Um, and in terms of looking at the number of requests, if an employee's made one during the 12-month period, um, a request made in the 12 months before the new act comes into force will count. So when you're tallying that up, so if someone makes one before that date, um, they will still have the right to bring a further one um, within that 12 month window. But after that, they will have then hit their two. Um, in terms of the decision period on flexible working requests, so under the current rules, it's a three month decision period, um, but that's going to be reduced to two months um, that is unless an extension is agreed by both parties which we do see happen in practice sometimes when an employer and employee are working through it but generally it now means that the default is going to be a two month decision period um, and the act's also going to remove some of the requirements on the employee so currently an employee when they're making a request will also need to set out the impact that they think it will have on the employer um, and also how that could be mitigated. For example, right now an employee may have to say that if they're not working a certain day, um, how that will have an impact and how that could be reduced. And another change being introduced is one that really reflects current good practice. So right now good practice says that you should consult with an employee about the request, but it's not actually a legal requirement. Um, but this new act will make it a legal requirement to have that discussion with them. So I suppose it's worth saying that really just the act's a further step forward when it comes to flexible working opportunities um, and the hope is that it will bring positive outcomes for both employers and employees. Um, however, there has been some criticism of it because ultimately people think that maybe the impact will be more limited. Uh, it's worth pointing out that there's no change to the grounds for rejecting a statutory uh, flexible working request. So. Right now, there are currently eight reasons, um, which some of you might be aware, but that includes it would cost the employer too much, um, that they can't reorganise work among other staff, that they can't recruit more staff, or that it would be a negative impact on quality. So whilst an employer needs to be reasonable in considering and responding to a flexible working request, the grounds for rejecting them are actually quite broad and can be relatively general. Um, and so by making it a day one right, it might not really have that big an impact on how they're dealt with in practice. Uh, and I think it's also worth pointing out that if it's being done on a day one request, an employer might have stronger grounds to reject it by saying that the candidate was effectively hired based on the job spec that was used. Um, and there was a clearer business need for them to work there or set out in that rather than to accommodate a request. So yeah, I think it remains to be seen really how much of an impact that will have. <clears throat> Um, and I suppose the other point of flagging is that really previously, most of the flexible working requests that were coming in, in the past were from female employees, but there has been a growing interest from male employees um, and also across a broader range of ages. So really just to track how that will change the demographics of the requests that we're seeing. And the final point on this one is just that ACAS has published its updated code of practice. So they have a code of practice that effectively sets how, how employers should be dealing with flexible working requests um, and how employees should be handling them. Um, the updated code of practice aims to emphasise the need for employers to create an environment where requests are handled with an open mind and meaningful dialogue. Uh, and employers should really be preparing for these changes along with the changes to the code by reviewing, update, reviewing their current policies and also processes in respect of flexible working. And I'm going to pass back to Rachel now for right to request more predictable working pattern. Thanks, Gav. Um, yeah, so a new piece of legislation, the workers, open brackets, predictable terms and conditions, close brackets, Act 2023, provides for a new and I think interesting statutory right to request a more predictable working pattern. Um, and the right is expected to come into force in September this year. Uh, interestingly, this new right will apply to workers and agency workers, so wider than flexible working requests. Um, and 
it, it does, or this new proposed model um, follows very closely the flexible working regime in a number of respects, which I'll go on to. But um, I should say that further regulations are expected to provide more detail. Um, uh, so this is really kind of high level summary of what we know so far about this, this new regime. So under the, the request model, a worker can make an application where there is a lack of predictability in relation to any part of the worker's work pattern and if they wish to get a more predictable work pattern. So that work pattern could relate to the number of hours that the worker works or the days of the weeks or times when the worker works or the period for which the worker is contracted to work, for example, a fixed term. A contract with a fixed term of 12 months or less is to be regarded automatically as having a lack of predictability, which I think is interesting. And an application can be made for a longer fixed term or the removal of the provision restricting its duration. So essentially removing that cap on, on the term of the fixed term contract. We think that there'll likely be a 26 week service requirement to make an application for a more predictable work pattern, um, but that will be uh, need to be confirmed by the regulations. As with the flexible working regime, employers will be, able, will be able to refuse requests for statutory reasons. So the request does not have to be granted if you can legitimately refuse it on one of the grounds. Um, but you will need a process for dealing with these requests and, and be prepared for receiving these applications. So very much like with a flexible working request, it really is a right to request rather than a right for that request to be granted. The grounds for refusal, which are very, very similar to those which apply to flexible working requests, are the burden of additional costs, detrimental effect on ability to meet customer, de customer demand, detrimental impact on the recruitment of staff, detrimental impact on other aspects of the employer's business, insufficiency of work during the periods the worker proposes to work, and planned structural changes. So lots of kind of wide buckets of potential reasons for, um, for refusal. Um, and some of the above reasons may be hard for a worker to challenge, but similarly to flexible working requests, there are indirect discrimination risks, which will need to be carefully considered. For example, if a woman asks only to be allocated work during school time, then there may be a potential indirect discrimination risk there if rejected, unless it can be objectively justified. Further regulations, as I've said, are expected about the form of applications and when such an application is to be made. But we do know that the employer must deal with the application in a reasonable manner and must give a decision within a month from the date that the application was made. Uh, there are also very similar provisions for agency workers. So agency workers can either make an application to the temporary work agency that supplies them or direct to the hider. The number of applications will be limited, so only two applications can be made in a 12 month period and only one at any one time, so a second application can't be made whilst one is being dealt with. In terms of potential remedies for, for failures to comply with this new regime, so claims can be made to the employment tribunal where the employer fails to comply with the various obligations under this new piece of legislation. If the employment tribunal finds that the claim is well founded, it must make a declaration to that effect and may make an order to reconsider the application or make an award of compensation if it considers just and equitable. There will be a cap on the award to be determined um, by those further regulations, but um, we expect it'll probably be similar to the award payable in flexible working request claims. So up to eight weeks pay seems likely. And again, that would be if it's found that there was a failure to, to comply with the requirements of this new regime. But very importantly, it will also be automatically unfair to dismiss an employee because the employee has made or proposed to make an application for a predictable work pattern. And um, furthermore, a worker has a right not to suffer detriment short of dismissal on those same grounds. So a key action for this one, and this is something that you'll hear me say several times throughout today's um, webinar, is that this is one for kind of creating a new policy or procedure, or perhaps amending your flexible um, working request procedure to include these new requirements. But I think training for managers will also be really important to avoid, to avoid a situation whereby a manager fails to follow proper procedure when one of these requests is made if they're unaware that it's caught by this new regime. Okay, I will pass back to Gavin.
Thanks very much. Uh, so, yeah, the next one I will be covering then is the new duty that's going to come into force in October 2024, um, which is on employers to take reasonable steps to prevent sexual harassment of their employees. Uh, so this is a duty that's come about under the Worker Protection uh, Amendment of the Equality Act 2010 Act 2023. Um, this is, again, another piece of legislation that has been in, in use a lot. There's been a lot of discussion and debate around it. Um, originally, it was meant to be much more far reaching. So there was going to be a new, new duty on employers to prevent third party harassment, um, which was seen as quite a broad step. Um, however, as this moved through Parliament, then that duty was removed, um, effectively following substantial debate on the point and concern that it might prohibit free speech. Um, the duty to take reasonable steps to, pre to prevent sexual harassment of employees was also watered down during the debate in Parliament. So uh, the current requirement is that it's going, uh, an employer is going to be required to take reasonable steps to prevent it. Um, previously in the draft, it was all reasonable steps to prevent sexual harassment. So again, kind of a watered down version of what was there um, and as this has moved through Parliament. So really right now it's difficult to say how this is going to apply in practice um, and it really raises the question as to what reasonable steps is going to entail so would this be met if an employer has only taken a couple of actions um, or is it something that's going to demand more substantial attention um, one of the things that has been pointed to in relation to this is the equality and human rights commission sexual harassment and harassment at work technical guidance, um, which we'll share a link to in the bulletin. Um, but that's effectively technical guidance that's been created by the EHRC. Um, and there has been a discussion around whether this is gonna become a statutory code of practice, which might be relied upon alongside the legislation. Um, and that in itself actually does set out preventative steps in terms of harassment. And so it could be that this is what the tribunals use to judge whether the reasonable steps have been taken. So. Just flagging then in terms of some of the steps that are already set out in that guidance. Um, one of them is having effective policies and procedures in place to deal with harassment. I would say that's good practice for any employer really. Um, but the key thing with these is really making sure that they're monitored and reviewed regularly. So um, we've seen in tribunal case law recently in terms of harassment claims, in terms of the reasonable steps defence, that it's not a, a reasonable step just to have um, policies and procedures in place it could be that they're very outdated so we've had some cases where actually policies haven't been refreshed for say 10 years uh, and that meant that an employer had failed in a duty to take reasonable steps um, the other one is being proactive in detection of harassment so considering early warning signs in the workplace are there places where people could report this so if someone's got sickness, persistent sickness absence, um, is there another underlying reason? Um, do people have regular one-to-ones with their manager where they feel comfortable to raise these issues? Um, is there a harassment reporting line? Um, could it be something like a whistleblowing line as well? Really just making sure um, that there's a chance for people to raise these concerns proactively and that an employer has a chance to detect them. And yeah, that leads on to the final point, just having effective channels for raising these concerns. So like I said, are there designated people who these can be raised to? Um, do people feel comfortable using these channels? And also regular training on harassment itself. So that kind of ties in with the policies and procedures point, but again, making sure people have specific training on this point and also on the policies and procedures and really making sure that that is refreshed regularly. Um, the only thing to say on that is that it's currently unclear um, if this will become the statutory code because there has been separate reference to the EHRC providing another statutory code um, to complement its technical guidance and that might then update the, the new duty following the consultation. So again, really a case of watching the space with this one uh, and seeing what does end up being published to support this. Um, but yeah, in the meantime, those steps I've recommended and suggested from the code already are really the ones that employers should be looking at, should make sure that they have ongoing training on it, and also that they have comprehensive policies covering workplace harassment. Um, the other thing just to say on this from a technical point is that this new duty isn't meant to alter the existing duty, um, which means that employers are responsible for any act of harassment unless they've taken all reasonable steps to prevent it. So that's kind of what I was touching on there in terms of policies being refreshed. If you're relying on that defence, 
of all reasonable steps. Um, so the effect of this new, du new duty is that if an employee succeeds with their sexual harassment claim, the tribunal then also has to consider whether the employer has failed to comply with a new and separate duty to take reasonable steps to prevent sexual harassment. And if the tribunal holds that that is the case, then the claimant can receive additional compensation of up to 25% of their compensatory award. So there's no standalone right to bring a claim under this legislation, um, but it is effectively a penalty on top of another claim. And it's also worth flagging that employers could be subject to enforcement action by the Equality and Human Rights Commission. Um, I would say this one is quite a difficult piece of legislation to get your head around from a practical perspective because it's not really sure, well, not really clear how it's going to apply in practice or what standard the tribunals will be applying to it. Um, it seems that from my perspective, if someone had failed within all reasonable steps defence, then in a sexual harassment claim, it would seem likely that they would fall foul of this new duty. Um, but as I said, it's difficult to, to know how this will operate in practice so far. So really just a case of waiting to see once it comes into force in October 2024, um, and once we have some more technical guidance to sit alongside it. And I'll pass back to Rachel just now. Thanks, Gav. Um, so the next one is a bit of a biggie, certainly from my perspective. So it's the extension of protection from redundancy during family leave. These new rights are expected to come into force in April this year and will allow for an extension of protection from redundancy to cover a larger period of time during pregnancy and after periods of maternity adoption or shared parental leave. Now, currently, employees on maternity leave, adoption leave or shared parental leave have a right to be offered a suitable alternative vacancy with an employer or an associated employer if one exists in a redundancy situation. In cases of pregnancy going forward, this redundancy protection will be extended starting when an employee notifies their employer of the pregnancy. Um, so again, that's extending it earlier than being on maternity leave, um, but will also extend it for a period ending 18 months from the first day of the estimated week of childbirth. The protected period will, however, be 18 months from the exact date of birth if the employee gives it the employer notice of the date of their child's birth. The extension of the protected period to cover pregnancy applies where the employer is informed of the pregnancy on or after 6th of April 2024, so it's not a kind of retrospective right, um, so do be mindful of that date, the 6th of April 2024. Um, and in respect of the additional protected period after maternity leave, the changes will come into effect where the employee's statutory maternity leave period ends on or after 6th April 2024, so again, 6th April 2024 being the key date to be reminded. Um, I should explain, however, that um, in, in very sad cases where a pregnancy ends and the employee is not entitled to statutory maternity leave, the protected period will end two weeks after the end of the pregnancy. In adoption cases, um, slightly different here, so the protected period will cover 18 months from placement for adoption, and it will apply where the employee's statutory adoption leave period ends on or after. 6th of April 2024. In cases of shared parental leave, the additional protected period begins on the day after the employee, this is lots of dates here, but begins on the day after the employee has taken six consecutive weeks shared parental leave and ends 18 months from birth or placement for adoption. So it only applies we're taking at least six weeks consecutive leave. Uh, but please do note that this protection will not apply if the employee has taken adoption leave or maternity leave. So it's not kind of additional double dip situation. And this change will come into effect where the employee's period of six consecutive weeks shared parental leave period starts on or after, you guessed it, 6th of April 2024. So again, with all of this, and I appreciate I very much sound like a broken record here, but this is one where consideration really should be given to updating your family leave policies. Um, but uh, education here, I think, is going to be absolutely key in terms of um, updating and educating your HR teams and your managers um, so that they are aware of these, these new obligations with a view to avoiding claims for automatically unfair dismissal. Um, moving swiftly on, back to Gav for fire and rehire. Yeah, so uh, this is a topic that, again, has been in the press quite a lot last year, really the big discussion on it came about following 
the P&O ferry scandal, um, which I'm sure you'll recall. Um, that wasn't strictly a, a fire and rehire scenario, but it did lead to a lot of public discussion about the practice. Um, and yeah, off the back of that, the government published a new code, uh, well, a draft code on the practice of dismissal and re-engagement. So that was back in February 2023. Um, and the government response and the final code is now expected this coming spring. So the new code itself deals with the practice of changing employment terms and conditions um, by way of dismissal and re-engagement, which more informally is known as fire and rehire. Um, it's a practice that's normally used where it's impossible to obtain employee or trade union consent to the changes. And so the employer takes the decision to dismiss and then offer people employment on the new change terms. Um, so in terms of the code itself, it doesn't it doesn't impose any binding legal obligations on employers, um, but it's worth flagging that employment tribunals could increase or decrease certain tribunal awards by up to 25% um, where employers or employees have unreasonably failed to comply with the code. So that's similar to yes. other codes, um, like I said, with the duty to prevent sexual harassment, potential 25% uplift. Um, it's a similar penalty for failing to follow the ACAS code on disciplinary and grievances. So not something that's unheard of. Um, really, the aim of the code is to ensure thorough and open information and consultation processes um, and that employers act fairly and reasonably um, when they're having these negotiations over changes to terms and conditions. Um, really, it's also emphasising that fire and rehire to change terms and conditions should only be used as a last resort. Uh, I would say most employers do view it like that just now, but really this is an attempt to kind of codify that and set it out as good practice for, for all employers. Um, as I said, there can also be a reduction in award by up to 25%. So if an employee fails to follow it, um, but really the obligations that are set out under the code are mainly focused on employers. So there's less likely to be scope for a reduction in practice. Uh, what I would say is that right now, the majority of large employers who are legally advisable probably already follow most of the steps that are set out in the code. Um, however, if the code is finalised in its current draft form, um, then it's really just being able to evidence that all these new requirements have been complied with. So in particular, um, one to flag is that they'll need to be able to comply with the requirement to continually review the proposals to change terms and conditions, um, which I'll come on to in a bit more detail. But as I said, if, if you fail to do that, you're potentially looking at a 25% uplift at tribunal. Uh, so some of the key points bearing in mind in relation to the draft code are, firstly, that it applies to any terms and conditions change exercise, so regardless of the number of employees affected. Um, normally, when you're seeing a terms and conditions change exercise, the consultation requirements can differ depending on the number of staff affected. So if it's more than 20, then you're looking at potential collective consultation. Um, regardless of that, this new code doesn't distinguish. So whether you're only changing for two or whether you're changing for 200, the code's still going to apply. Um, the next one is that once it's clear to the employer that employees aren't prepared to accept the changes, the first step should be for the employer to re-examine the business strategy and plans in light of the potentially serious consequences for employees. Um, so an employer should continue to reassess its proposals, uh, consider all relevant factors um, as its discussions and consultations progress. So again, really stressing this new requirement to do a continual review uh, and whether it's still appropriate to press ahead. Um, where there's more than one change to terms, so we might often see a couple of changes being proposed at once. Um, the code currently suggests that it should be considered if these can be phased rather than all being done at once. Uh, another point which, again, is probably current good practice, but just providing as much notice of the change as possible. Um, and on that point, the employer should be considering whether any particular employees might actually need longer notice in order to make arrangements um, to accommodate the changes. So where there's maybe a change to working hours or maybe where there's a change to location, um, then some employees might need more time to change child care arrangements uh, or to plan their new journey, um, for example, to accommodate mobility needs. And where possible, an employer should be agreeing to a longer notice period to enable their employees to make these kind of arrangements or to find alternative work. Um, where an employee unilaterally imposes changes and the employee works under protest, the employer should be continuing to discuss the changes with the employee or their representatives 
uh, with a view to effectively finding agreement. So the employer should continually be assessing whether actually it needs to implement the change uh, or whether now there has been a change in circumstances, which means that they can go back to the previous term um, and effectively get agreement with that on the, the employee. Uh, the employer should continue to discuss with the employees any adverse impacts um, and again, consider anything that can be done to negate those. So really there's much more of a positive duty on the employer to really review its proposals and consider uh, in light of changing circumstances, whether they're still appropriate. And the final one to flag is that a threat of dismissal should never be used only as a negotiating tactic um, where the employer isn't actually contemplating that. So it shouldn't be used as a threat. Um, it should only be mentioned if there is a genuine consideration for it. Um, and with that, I will pass on to Rachel for the final proposed change. Lovely. Thanks, Gav. Um, so I'm being a bit sneaky with this one because it's actually not expected to come into force until April 2025. And we don't yet have the regulations which will properly define the entitlement and bring it into force, but it's certainly one to have on your radar. So I'm just sneaking it in here as a kind of last topic before we hand over to, to Vincent on immigration. So this new legislation will provide a new entitlement to neonatal leave and pay for employees whose babies spend an extended period of time in neonatal care. It will allow eligible employees who have a parental or other personal relationship with a child who is receiving or has received neonatal care to take paid leave, in addition to other leave entitlements such as maternity and paternity leave. So quite a big departure from the current family leave regime. Um, Neonatal care hasn't yet been fully defined, so that's something that will need to be fleshed out in the regulations, but it must commence within the first 28 days after birth and last at least seven days. So that's the neonatal care rather than the leave, um, but just to be classed for leave in relation to neonatal care, it must be care that was within the first 28 days of birth and lasts at least seven days. Um, entitlement to this form of leave is expected to be up to 12 weeks but again that's something that will need to be confirmed by the regulations and those regulations will also specify when the leave can be taken. Those regulations may provide for it to be taken after neonatal care has ended so that it could be taken after another form of leave in order that that form of leave is not reduced, for example, and um, potentially could be taken after a period of maternity leave if that maternity leave has already commenced and, and taking that neonatal leave at the start would be too complex. Um, although the relevant act, which we do have sight of, sets a limit of at least 68, 68 weeks from birth. Um, so again, making sure that these parents have that kind of cushion um, such that hopefully this form of leave can be taken following another form of leave rather than at the start. In order to qualify for um, neonatal care pay, as with other forms of parental leave, an employee will be required to be employed for a minimum of 26 weeks prior to the leave being requested. The amount is expected to be the same as statutory maternity pay and statutory paternity pay, unless, of course, an employer opts to enhance it. But again, that's one where the regulations will set out the level and duration of pay, um, but it will be able to be claimed for at least 12 weeks. Um, personally, I love this change. I think it's a really positive one to end on on the employment topics today. Without these changes, um, what the feedback has been is that parents of a child in neonatal care are often left to use holidays or um, unpaid leave. And um, that's particularly for those employees who, for example, are potentially only uh, entitled to paternity leave. So, so two weeks, um, which is almost always insufficient for a child who's in neonatal care. So they're left with um, using unpaid leave or holiday, um, holiday entitlement during what's undoubtedly an extraordinarily difficult time. So having this additional form of leave, I think, will be hugely helpful for people who find themselves in that very difficult situation. And again, broken record time, when, when the time comes, this will be one for updating uh, policies and, and educating within the workforce. Okay, so you've heard enough from, from Gav and I. Thank you very much for listening to all of that. I appreciate there was a lot of detail in there. As I say, it will be followed up both with the recording and in our written bulletin. Um, but before I eat into more of this time, I'm going to hand over to lovely Vincent on immigration. Uh, thanks, uh, Rachel and Gavin. I always find it really interesting to hear what um, the changes are on employment. Um, so I am going to cover some of the um, expected upcoming immigration changes. Um, so 
towards um, the end of last year, there were quite a number of uh, changes that had been announced uh, both by the Prime Minister and uh, the Home Office, um, the Home Secretary. Uh, what I will do is I'm going to cover the, the first uh, change that we do know is definitely coming into play. And that is for um, the that's on the immigration health surcharge. Um, so that was first introduced in 2015, and it's payable as part of most visa applications by migrants. So not a cost that is paid by sponsors or employers, but a cost that's paid by individuals. And the IHS or the Immigration Health Surcharge allows migrants to access the NHS. Um, although I do think it is a, a bit of a double taxation, which is quite cheeky in terms of those who, those migrants who work, they also pay uh, national insurance contributions. So it's a bit of a double taxation, taxation, but it's still something that they do need to pay as part of their visa application. So currently the immigration health surcharge rate is uh, payable for main adult applicants um, at £624 times the length of their visa. So if they're applying for a five-year visa, for example, they need to pay an upfront payment of uh, five times £624. Um, so that's a, obviously quite a big lump sum. So what we do know that's happening, what is changing is that from the 6th of February 2024, um, any visa applications that are submitted on or after this date, they'll be subject to a higher immigration health surcharge rate. So that is going to go up to £1,035 um, per year, again, times the length of the visa. So if it's a five-year visa that they're applying for, they're looking at paying just over £5,000. And again, that is just for um, the immigration health surcharge, and that doesn't cover the visa application fees. So if you are a, an employer who covers um, your workers uh, visa applications and or their immigration health surcharge fees as part of a clawback or whatnot, then it's worth encouraging them to make an application um, on or before 5th of February. Um, there's, no, there's not going to be a reduced rate if they already have a visa before this, uh, before this date. So, and, anyone who already has an existing visa when they come to apply for an extension or renewal visa which will inevitably be on or after 6th of february they will be subject to this increase and um, so that's one of the sort of definitive changes that we know will definitely happen so some of the other changes that i'm going to touch on and um, they're expected to be uh, coming in later this year and um, we don't have the exact date and um, we, ha we haven't um, seen the formal draft of the changes. They've not yet been published, so all we're working on at the moment um, are just various uh, written communications from the UK government. Most of, these expect uh, most of these changes, we're expecting that they'll come into play in April, uh, but I'll mention some other dates if I think um, I, I know uh, that they'll be coming in at different times. So one of the main uh, things that will be changing or that we are expecting to change is um, the current uh, minimum salary threshold for skilled workers. So as some of you might be aware, the current um, minimum salary rate that must be paid to a skilled worker is £26,200 gross per annum. So what we are expecting is that from April, and may or may not be 6th of April, um, but from April, we are expecting that the general salary threshold will jump up to £38,700 gross per annum. So quite a big jump. Um, the current literature states that this increase will not apply to existing skilled worker visa holders. So in other words, what we're expecting is that these, um, this increase in the salary that must be paid um, that this will only apply to new initial skilled worker visa applicants who are applying for the visa on or after this rule change. So it seems to be the case that existing visa holders will just be uh, subjected to the current rules um, opposed to these new um, changes as and when they uh, come to extend their visa. Um, so again, if any uh, businesses are currently intending on um, sponsoring a, a new migrant, then it's worth acting sooner rather than later 
just to um, save on some costs um, where possible. Um, off the back of uh, some of these changes that are happening to the, the skilled worker route, um, there is the sort of subset healthcare worker visa. Um, so what the current literature is saying is that um, migrants who are applying for this type of um, subset visa, they will be exempt from the um, new increase to £38,700. So that will be quite, um, uh, I, I suspect that that will be quite welcome news uh, to uh, employers who uh, use this particular visa, such as those on um, the NHS or um, uh, care homes. And uh, talking about um, care homes and care workers, um, what we're expecting is that there will be some changes um, to the, the care home sector and care workers in relation to sponsorship. And we're expecting that this will come into play as soon as possible. Um, so as far as I'm aware, there's not been any um, other com communications issued by government saying the exact date, but we're just, um, we, we are told that it's as soon as possible. So what we do know is that, or what we are um, expecting that will come into play is that for new initial um, care worker visa applicants uh, and, and senior care worker visa applicants, they'll not be able to bring in uh, their dependents with them to the UK when these uh, changes take place. Uh, so for anyone who's already working in the UK under the uh, sponsorship code of a care worker or a senior care worker, again, we're expecting that um, they'll still be able to bring dependents over um, to the UK under the current rules. So they won't be uh, subjected to the new rules. The new rules we're expecting will only apply to new visa applicants. And what we're also expecting is that for um, social care firms that operate in England, um, there will be uh, uh, an expectation that they will need to obtain um, regulation um, from the Care Quality Commission um, in order to be able to sponsor um, care workers and senior care workers. So that's something new that we're expecting and that's only for uh, firms in England. We're not sure whether there will be um, sort of changes to, to the way that um, things operate in Scotland. Uh, so we'll just need to wait and see. But again, we're expecting that these rules will come into play as soon as possible. Um, in terms of some other changes, uh, that is the uh, shortage occupation list. So for those who uh, don't know, this is used for the purposes of um, the, the skilled worker sponsorship. And um, if you're sponsoring someone um, on a job that appears on the shortage occupation list, then you will be able to benefit from a 20% discount on the salary rate. Um, so what we are expecting is that this shortage occupation list um, will come to an end in April. And it will then instead be um, replaced or rather renamed um, to uh, being called the Immigration Salary List. The Migration Advisory Committee, um, they've, uh, they were instructed last week by the Home Office to um, carry out a, a new review. And uh, the Migration um, Advisory Committee have um, acknowledged that um, instruction and they'll come back to the Home Office uh, in due course. But what they won't be able to do is they won't be able to get input from stakeholders. And so what they will be doing is they'll be um, providing their review um, and, and recommendations to the Home Office based on existing data. And what it does seem to me is that there will still be some discounts that are applicable, but it's not clear uh, how much that will be or you know, whether it will be 20% or less than 20%. And um, what we are also expecting is that there will be a bit of an overhaul on the new list in terms of what jobs appear on that shortage occupation list. Um, until this new um, immigration salary list uh, comes into play, which again we're, we're expecting to be in April, the current shortage occupation list will still um, apply. And as and when this new list comes into play, I would be expecting that there will be um, further changes uh, made to that list. So it is a bit of a wait and see uh, in terms of what will happen um, on, on that list and in terms of shortage, uh, shortage occupation jobs. Um, another change that I wanted or a proposed change that I wanted to flag up is on uh, 
graduate visas. So at the moment, this option is for uh, migrants who have um, completed successfully completed their studies in the UK. Um, it allows them to work in the UK um, for up to three years, depending on the level of their studies, without sponsorship. So um, they would be able to work for any business without needing to get any sort of further immigration clearance or whatnot. Um, what the Home Office have said in their uh, announcements last year is that they're going to ask the Migration Advisory Committee to review this option. So it's not clear what, what will happen to this um, visa category, whether it will be um, abolished or whether it will be reformed. Um, so it's one of those wait and sees, but I think it, if it was to be um, uh, cancelled altogether, it would affect um, employers uh, because as I understand it from my experience speaking with clients is that they are quite reliant on hiring migrants who have these uh, graduate visas, so it might cause a bit of a shortfall in the um, labour market. Um, just some other changes I want to touch on uh, for um, or, or for visitors. So um, visitors can't work in the UK um, unless the activities that they will undertake are expressly permitted. Um, so there will be some positive changes on the 31st of January 2024, so um, ne next week, um, in relation to ICT, so intercompany transfer. So um, at the moment, there are current um, express provisions in terms of people coming over um, uh, from a linked entity uh, overseas coming to the UK. But what they can do is quite limited. But one of the positive changes is that they will be able to work directly uh, with clients um, in the UK as long as there's that link. And another change is that um, remote working will be expressly permitted, but it can't be um, the main activity for a visitor. Um, and just a few more um, things to touch on is that um, the Home Office are moving towards um, a completely digitalised uh, immigration system. So some migrants at the moment, they're still issued uh, biometric residence permits, and they're only valid until the 31st of December 2024. And there's an expectation that from next year, um, there will be no BRPs issued um, whatsoever. Um, so it might be something that you'll start to notice or it might not be anything that you'll notice at all in terms of if you're carrying out right to work checks because um, BRPs haven't been accepted as um, evidence of right to work checks for quite some time now. And just a last point to end on is that um, we're obviously um, expecting that there will be a general election later on this year. So it will be um, interesting for um, from an immigration perspective and perhaps also an employment perspective um, to see what um, and how this will affect the anticipated changes um, that we've all uh, mentioned uh, today. Uh, so that's everything that I wanted to uh, cover in immigration. Thanks so much, Vincent. And look, bang on, one one twenty nine, giving everyone back <laughs> one minute of their lunch hour, although maybe I'll take that up. Um, thank you, everyone, so much for sticking with us. I um, appreciate that. It was a very quick whistle stop tour through so many changes. So please do reach out if you've got any questions. Thank you uh, to those of you who included messages in the chat function. I think we've answered all of those. If we've missed any, please reach out. We'd be delighted to chat to you directly. And yeah, thanks again for listening and um, all the best for battling with all of these changes over the course of the, the next year. Thanks all.